Good morning, everyone. Did you all have a good Christmas? It's good to hear. Hey, uh, it really is great to have so many visitors uh, here with us this morning. Tim, you are never going to live it down for closing church for the day. And, uh, and Pastor Dan Pizelak, mate. Do you know, as I was praying this morning, I just really felt... Uh, Dan sent me a little text message this morning. He's like, I've heard this really awesome preacher on at Seton today. <laughs> and for a minute I went, Pastor Bill wasn't down to preach, were you... <laughs> <laughs> Dan, you spent a lot of time uh, renovating your house. You help other people find housing. I feel like God's going to do a renovation in you this year. And, uh, and so be open to what God is, is building in you and uh, expanding the, uh, I don't know, what is it, the, the, the tents of your house or uh, maybe baby number six is on the way, I don't know. <laughs> Just uh, receive that in Jesus' name. <laughs> and to everyone else visiting, it's great to have you have you here. Dan is now panicking. He's gone bright red. And uh... Can you believe that the last service of the decade? I used to watch years ago, Clive James, uh, the, the, you know, the journalist, passed away just a couple of months ago. He used to do a review of the year, a review of the decade. It's very dry wit. I used to love watching, uh, watching those. So I kind of, I've been reflecting a little bit about uh, the decade, and we've, we've seen some changes in the last 10 years. Like if you think about, uh, you know, for example, movies and TV. People actually used to go to the movies at cinemas and they used to turn the TV on and watch a program at an appointed time. Now it all just streams to your device. Whenever you want it, it's at your fingertips, doesn't it? And it's like, or smartphones. Ten years ago, smartphones were a novelty. And now it, we've all got them, don't we? We just kind of, you, you wouldn't think of, of living without them. Or what about politics? Uh, somebody just groaned there. Well, <laughs> Do you remember who our Prime Minister was 10 years ago? Does anyone remember? It was actually Julia Gillard. And we've had five Prime Ministers since then. Uh, Kevin Rudd came back again. He had another, had another stint. And then we had Tony, and then we had Malcolm, and now we have uh, Prime Minister Morrison. So in that same amount of time, America's only had one change of president. But wow, what a change of president. <laughs> Life is never dull with President, <laughs> President Trump, is it? How many people follow his Twitter feed here? There's a few of you. Yeah. It's exciting. That's, that's the word for it. Hey, there's been all sorts of... I mean, climate change was a foreign concept 10 years ago. or well, certainly didn't get talked about in the ways it does now, or the Me Too movement. There's been a lot of political and, and social changes across the decade. What about your personal world? Sometimes I, I'm, I'm quite a self-reflective person. I like looking back and, and reflecting and, and thinking. Not everybody does. Sometimes people just like to move, move on and go, no, nah, I think I'd rather forget about that. And uh, we can understand. What's the point of looking back? He was, I put a, a, few, a list of uh, reasons why we might look back. Have we got those there? Reasons why we might look back. Well, for one, we might look back with a little bit of regret. That happens sometimes when, when the year doesn't go so well and maybe things in our life weren't that good. We can look back with a little bit of, of regret. Sometimes we might look back on, and, and reminisce. You know, we've had a nice time. Maybe there's been a, like a special event, something good that happened uh, in your life throughout the year, but it doesn't really change the, the course of where we're moving forward. There might be times when you reflect and you think deeply and you draw some conclusions and learn from your experiences. You might uh, make resolutions. How many people here have ever made a New Year's resolution? Hold, pop up your hand. We'll do a little survey here. Now keep your hand up. How many people kept that New Year's resolution? Let's have a look. Oh, one. Dan's not sure. Oh, well, somebody's waving at the back there. They're very keenly kept, that one. Hey, look, they're not easy to, to keep, are they? We kind of, we set ourselves maybe these goals and 
they're not always easy to keep. Or maybe there's a time for resetting, which is when there's a fresh start and you would start over. And that's what we're talking about in this series. So um, the purpose of looking back is to be thankful for what Jesus has done and learn from our past. And the purpose of looking forwards is to be expectant for what Jesus is going to do. And today I just want to share a couple of little observations, one about looking backwards and one about looking forwards, that I think is going to be helpful as we step into uh, a, a new year and a new decade. So the first thing I want to share is about looking backwards. And that is that looking back reveals our true heart. Looking back reveals our true heart. Um, it's not always a bad thing to look back. Some, sometimes a difficult thing, but it's not, it's not a bad thing. Sometimes if it's done with wisdom and hindsight and purpose and a, and a pure heart and a motive, uh, it can be very helpful in, in helping us to move forward. But sometimes looking back also reveals some, some attitudes and, and desires in us that are not so good. And when we look back, we might see, oh, yeah, I was angry and out of control there, or I was frustrated, or I, I was a bit bitter over that situation. Um, and we have some, some regrets. Now, a couple of uh, Bible stories come to mind when, when we talk about looking back. And the first one for me that came to mind was the story of Lot in Genesis. And some of you will, will know this. Lot and his family lived in a city called Sodom, which was near another city called Gomorrah. And those two cities were both very decadent and debaucherous. There was a lot of partying, drinking, drugs, violence, a lot of immorality. Um, and it was, it was pretty bad. Uh, Lot was a good man. And so God saw that and, and recognized that. Anyway, one day two angels come to the city. And, uh, and they look like just two ordinary guys. And uh, Lot invites them into his home and, and talks with them. And, and suddenly these two guys, these angels, say to Lot, um, you need to flee for your life. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the plain. He goes, just head to the mountains or you're going to be swept away. Because God had decided that these two towns... Um, that he was going to level them. Now, that instruction to not look back is a very specific one because those uh, angels knew that even one longing look back to the old life was enough to stir up uh, sinful desires of the heart because that's what we're like as people. It's very easy sometimes. Uh, we, we, we're born into sin we're human, we have, uh, we're frail and have failings as, uh, as human beings do. So Lot and his family, kind of, they don't quite know what to do. They're sort of umming and ahhing. And you can kind of understand, can't you? If somebody came up to you and said, leave your house, grab your stuff and get out of here, you'd be going, well, hang on, this, our house is here, our, our lives are here. Yeah, we know it's not... You know, there's, it's not that good. but and, and so the angels grab them by the hands, take them to the edge of the city and just say, run, get out of here. So Lot and his two daughters, they don't look back. They just head for the mountains and they get out of there. But Lot's wife is a different story. Let's have a look what happens with Lot's wife. Verse 26. Have we got it up there on screen? Lot's wife looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt it says she became a pillar of salt now this is kind of a bit weird you're kind of thinking i mean i don't know how many people you might know that have turned into a pillar of salt i can't i, I can only think of one or two there's not a huge number of uh of people look it doesn't say much more than that in the text right but we can assume, and, and Bible scholars and, and interpreters have said this over many hundreds of years, there was a part of her that wanted to be back there in the city. She loved the old life. There was a little bit of her that wanted to be back there partying and being with her friends. 
And as a result, she became solidified like a statue. So what's the point that they're trying to make here? If we long for the old life, for the past, for a life without God, it immobilizes us. It becomes impossible to move forward. If you're constantly looking backwards, it's impossible to move forwards. Jesus also talked about leaving the old life and, uh, and leaving it behind and moving forward. He had a lot of people coming to him and saying, oh, Jesus, we want to follow you. We just want to be part of what you're doing and I follow you. But can you just wait first because I'm going to go back and do all this other stuff that's important to me first, uh, get my old life in order, and, and then we'll come and follow you. And Jesus says, nobody who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, it kind of sounds pretty harsh. I mean, somebody, here's somebody saying, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to, so, you know, that's, isn't that a good motive? But Jesus says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, I'm no gardening expert or farmer. I have not personally plowed a field. Um, but I suspect you can't successfully push a plow in a straight line in one direction if you're constantly looking in that direction, right? You've got to look where you're going. It'd be like driving a car and only have looking in the rearview mirror. We don't do that, do we? It's silly because you've got to look where you're going. Occasionally, we have to get our bearings and we have a look in the rearview mirror. But you have to be looking forward. Jesus doesn't want us to constantly live in regret or in retrospect. And neither does he expect us to do it alone. He wants to do life with us. And I'll come back to that in, in just a moment. Looking back is not bad if it helps you to move forward. Um, for example, when I started teaching, I, I started as, as a high school teacher about 15 years ago. did that for several years. And at the end of my first year, uh, as, as any uh, school teacher knows, the end of your first year of teaching is exhausting because you're just getting used to how it all works. And, uh, and so I started to reflect on, on how it had gone. And nobody sat me down and said, you should do a little evaluation. And, you know, I just kind of did it on a whim. But I thought, if I can keep doing what went well and learn from my mistakes, then I'm going to get better. And so I wrote down three little questions. Have we got them there on the screen? And these work in any situation if you're self-evaluating or reflecting. I thought about what went well. Well, actually, there was a few things that went well for me as a teacher in my first year. There were some assignments that I did with students that I observed they were really engaged with, they loved doing, uh, they enjoyed it, they learned something out of it, and I thought, I'm going to do those again with other students next year. What didn't go so well? Classroom behavior did not go so well. And... Uh, <laughs> I was kind of getting used to that, uh, and I had to learn some, some things about how do you build that respect with, with a group of 30 kids, students, and how do you set boundaries about what's appropriate behavior in the classroom, and all those kind of things. So I had to learn that, and I noticed that no, that, was, that one didn't go so well. And then that third question really becomes your, your item list for, for things that you're going to do to get better. How could I do it better? And, uh, and to my surprise, I put some of those things into action. I got a little bit better. Not perfect. There were still things I needed to work on. And in 12 months' time, I thought, you know what? I'm going to do that again. I sat down, did the same process because I wanted to get better and better at what I was doing. And so it's a good uh, little exercise. Maybe as you look back over the course of this year, there might be moments that you're really proud of or you're pleased with, things that went well. There might be other moments that you regret or wish you could fix. Maybe a little bit like Lot's wife. You look back longingly on an old life, an old habit that's hindering you from moving forward. Jesus can set you free from that. And he doesn't want us to live our lives in reverse. He doesn't want us to live our lives chained up and hindered by our past. He wants to see us moving forward in freedom. Amen? And so looking back 
reveals our true heart. But looking forward reveals what Jesus has done for us and what he's going to do for us. Can I say, I believe that Jesus has good things in store for all of us in 2020. I can say that without fear of a doubt. The scriptures declare it over and over. God has only good plans for us, plans to prosper and not to harm us. All things are possible to those who believe. And in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And those are promises that you can stand on and, uh, and believe. As you look forward in faith, what is it that Jesus wants to show you about your future? I don't know all the specifics of everybody's life details in this room, but I do know that it's in line with the same instructions that he gave to his disciples just before Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1. They were all sitting around there, they're talking, and, and the disciples were a little bit hung up on uh, when the end of the world was going to be. What's it going to look like? When's it going to happen? So they, they asked Jesus that a couple of times. And Jesus said, look, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. In fact, elsewhere, Jesus said, look, I don't even know when that is. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. See, we don't need to be, live in fear of our future because he's given us the Holy Spirit. Now, in this case, the, the disciples that waited 40 days uh, and then the Holy Spirit came on them. You can read that story in Acts chapter 2. But we have access to the Holy Spirit today. If you love the Lord, if you desire Him in your life, all you have to do is ask and receive by faith. And you can receive it today. He says, you will receive the Holy Spirit when He comes on you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And if we contextualize that for our own situation, we might say, well, we're witnesses in, in Seton, in our local community, and in Adelaide, and in South Australia, in Australia, and to the ends of the earth. Now you might say, well, I can't do that. I can't go to the ends of the earth. What are you talking about? Yes, you can. We talked about it just earlier today, supporting Jeremy Steele. You might not physically be able to go to places, but you can support people like Jeremy, who is going into places like India and Ghana and Myanmar and others, and, uh, and having a powerful witness there. You can support people in that. So after Jesus has said that, he's taken up before the disciples into heaven. It says, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And it says they were looking intently, looking intently up into the sky as he was going. And suddenly, two men dressed in white, another two angels, stood beside them. Now you can understand why the disciples are probably standing there going, where's Jesus gone? Is he... You know, is he coming back in five minutes? What's, what's happening here? And these angels kind of go, guys, why are you standing there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. It's no good standing around looking intently, good intentions, but looking intently in places like the clouds where we think Jesus might be. People look for Jesus in all sorts of places. But instead, we should seek him in the places where he truly resides. Well, where's that, you might ask? Well, he's in our prayer times. As we relate to him, as we reach out to him, if he's in our life, he's there in our prayer times. He's there in our Bible reading and our devotions. That's why we put this life reading plan together. And I'm so excited about some of the things we've got in here uh, this year. Um, some interesting new little ways of just getting into the Word. And we cover the Gospels uh, every year. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We always make sure they're in there. Why? Because we want you to know more of Jesus and fall more in love with Him. And get to know Him better. So He's there in our, in our Bible reading and devotions. He's there in our church gatherings. When we come together, the Bible says, if when two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am uh, in the midst. He's here when we gather together, and he's there in our service. We don't just serve 
uh, in our own strength alone. Jesus is there walking alongside us. Look what he, what, what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. And you might have read this verse many, many times. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. You might have come to the end of 2019 and you might be feeling weary and burdened. Been a tough year, tough couple of years. And you really feel the weight of that. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and I'm humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. There are some of you here this morning, you need rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Have a look at this, uh, a different translation. Same passage, this is from the message paraphrase. I love the way this is worded. It says, are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion, just going through the motions but not sensing God's spirit? He says, come to me, get away with me, and you will recover your life. Recovering your life in him. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. How good is that? Recover your life in Jesus. Walk with him. Work with him. And as we keep company with him, we learn to live and walk in freedom. Hallelujah. I had the privilege yesterday of catching up with some friends that I haven't seen for, for nearly 12 months to hear about what they're doing. And that was uh, Yen and Lewis Daly. And we had a great time catching up. And I just asked Yen if she would just come and share a little bit because... Um, as, as she shared, I thought, yeah, actually, she's somebody who's, who's reflected in this way. And I love uh, what you've been up to. So um, it is fantastic to see you here. It's so good to see all of you, <laughs> honestly. Why don't you just share with us, remind the church just a little bit. You and Lewis moved to Cebu in the Philippines at the beginning of this year in February. Is that right? Yeah. January. And so just remind us a little bit about the organisation that you've been working for there and just what it is you've been, been doing. Sure. Um, so I, uh, at the start of this year, I went to go and intern with an organisation called International Justice Mission. And uh, basically their whole mission, and they exist to tackle the problem of everyday violence for the global poor. So what that looks like practically is that we go into countries um, that have dysfunctional or very under-resourced justice systems, because in those countries, when your justice system isn't working properly or it's very weak, crime runs rampant. And basically um, those who are most affected by that and by those crimes and who are hurt the most are gonna be the most vulnerable in your society. And so that's the poor. Right, so um, the way that we do that is that we um, partner with our local authorities, we partner with the governments and we help them um, tackle a specific crime that is um, a very everyday crime uh, for their nation. And so I was placed in the Philippines and unfortunately the everyday crime there that they're tackling is something called online sexual exploitation of children. And that's just a really fancy name for saying, um, uh, for a crime that involves a recording child abuse and making it available on the internet or live streaming it. Um, so that's what we do. And so I work with a team of lawyers that uh, prosecute uh, the facilitators of these crimes. So that's what I've kind of been doing for the past year. Yep. Yeah. So it's such an important job um, and what she's doing there. So in, um, so IJM is a, it's a faith-based organisation. So you're working together with other Christians on yeah. a daily basis. Um, so as you've reflected on this year, just share with us, what has Jesus shown you uh, about your own heart and walking with him? Oh, it's just a million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> um, yes. So Nathan yeah, asked me to reflect on this question and, uh, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity for reflection. That's why we're here. Um, but it is really difficult. Uh, you know, I, I think that this year um, what Jesus has really revealed to me about my heart um, well, firstly, I need to premise it with like what he really revealed to me. I went into this year knowing this crime. Um, I went into this year knowing the reality that our world is broken. But I think there's um, something about seeing evil face to face. 
um, that is really quite horrible and has broken my heart, to be quite honest. Um, so uh, what he revealed to me actually was how much I am not willing to boast in my weakness. <laughs> you know, uh, Paul in the Bible, he explicitly states that the Lord's power is made perfect in his weakness. And, you know, I'm a person that yearns to see God's power in its perfection. But then I was confronted with the reality that actually I'm not willing to boast in my weakness. I'm not willing to say that how imperfect I am or how limited I am or um, how ill-equipped I am to face a world that's actually that dark. But, um, you know, it's been through God's grace that he's placed me in an organization, in a workplace um, that's full of strong, resilient Christians that have also had to tackle with those questions. And in a work environment um, where they're facing this evil every day. Um, but I really actually had to get used to coming into a team of lawyers who every day um, would state that they can't do this in their human strength alone. Um, and so it was so good to be around a community of Christians who every day we would boast in our weakness together and they were able to show me that if I wanted to walk the path of Jesus, if I believed in a restoring God and I believed in his purpose and I wanted to take up the invitation to walk with him to do that, that I can't do that in my strength alone, but there is a God who shines brighter than the darkness of that evil in this world. So yeah, I've been very privileged to walk with them um, through that. And it's something I'm really still learning, of course. Um, um, but it's yeah, been my honour and been a great blessing to me this year. Um, you know, we're just incredibly proud of, of you and Lewis uh, in what you're doing there. And I know you've um, decided to stay there a little bit longer and continue what you're doing for the time being. Um, so how you, I mean, you really just said it there. I mean, how do you describe your, just your need for Jesus yeah. going into 2020 and your reliance on him? Yeah. Um, so... Because you're so right, Nathan, what you were saying about the promises of God um, and how, you know, I really invite anyone, if they're feeling like those promises aren't clear, um, go talk to someone. Even if you're not a big Bible reader and you're not quite there yet to go flick through your Bible and try to find them, go talk to someone um, and there will be a promise for you. And, and that's what I'm hoping for you because this year really has been about grasping onto those promises, letting them seek deep down into you when the rest of the world will call you foolish for holding onto them. Um, for Because going into this year, I knew intellectually about the hope, the radical hope that we have as Christians, the fact that God promises a new heavens and a new earth and new creation and the fact that um, he's already shown that to us through Jesus, through what he's done on the cross, through his resurrection, we can get swept up in his new creation power right here and right now. Um, and so this year has really been just grabbing tightly and holding firmly to those promises, even though everything else around you would say, that's silly. That, why would you do that? Don't you see the reality of the brokenness? But there is a dual reality that we have to hold on to as Christians, and that is we have what we sang today, we have a living hope. Um, he walks with us, and I think that's what I need. Uh, that's what I'll be praying for this year with my walk with Jesus is... Um, you know, I was thinking about it, like if Jesus is our living hope, we're always talking about walking in hope, but I want to walk with my living hope. Um, I want to remember that he's always with me um, and uh, that this, this life, <laughs> you know, a lot of people who are a bit more wiser, older than me, they're going to chuckle at me and do so. I'm a slow learner. It's all right. But um, yeah, this, you know, Jesus walked a suffering path and he walked a servant path. And I think um, we need to remember that in the reality of a hard life. Um, but knowing that um, joy is not the absence of pain, it's here for you right now. Hope is only born out of, you know, what Paul says, like trials and suffering is in, uh, produces endurance and endurance produces character and character hope. So, um, so know that... Um, if you had a difficult 2019 and it doesn't look like it's letting up, um, you are not, that's not a barrier for you to access hope. If anything, that's, uh, 
even more reason <laughs> that Jesus wants to crush that barrier and get to you and be your hope. Um, so, uh, so what I'll be praying for, for all of you and for, for you as my extended church family, because honestly, like it's through your support, if we're reflecting over the decade, I came, I came into this church as a baby Christian. You guys housed me. You guys were my family. Um, and yeah, I just want to pray for all of us that um, despite the, the darkness, despite the hardship and the suffering, um, that we would all just be enlightened and know that Jesus is and we can walk with him, our living hope. Yeah. So good. Let's put our hands together and thank you, Here is somebody who has recovered their life in Jesus and is now helping other people to find life in him. And I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you're at the point of saying, I need to recover my life. I feel lost. I need Jesus. You can reach out to him and receive him today. Others of you, Jesus might be speaking to you about 2020. He might be stirring you up and saying, hey, I want you to walk with me, work with me. And he might be uh, unleashing some ministry potential in you. Whatever it is, whatever God has for you in 2020, I know it's only good. The world is behind us, but the cross is before us. Amen? And Christ's presence is all around us. Can we stand together? Let's pray and reach out to Jesus. Respond to him this morning. You might like to bow your heads. Close your eyes. This is a time between us and God. Let me lead you in a prayer. Oh, Father, we just thank you so much. We thank you for the year that has been. Lord, even though there might be up and down times that we've faced, Lord, we know that your love for us is constant in all things, that you are our great hope, and that when we walk with you, Lord, we can move forward with great hope. We thank you because you're at work in each of our lives. Sometimes we may not always feel that, but Lord, we stand on the truth of the promises of your word. And Lord, we say in 2020, have your way in us. Break those chains, the things that have held us back. Breathe life into us afresh. Stir our hearts, Lord, for all that you have for us. Just while we're in this moment of prayer and heads are bowed, no one looking around. If there are some of you here who you, you need Jesus in your life, you want, to, want him in your life, as you've listened this morning, as you've heard Yen share, as you've listened to the, the stories of the scriptures, you're saying, I need you, Jesus, in my life. You can have him this morning. You can receive him into your heart. It's a simple as inviting him into your heart. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you want Jesus in your heart this morning, while no one's looking around, just pop your hand up and you can receive him this morning. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Others of you here, you want to reach out to Jesus this morning, receive him into your heart. Thank you, Lord. Let me lead you now in a prayer. And I reckon it'd be good even for all of us, this last service of the year, of the decade, uh, even in recommitting our lives to Jesus afresh. You just pray this in your heart as I lead you. Jesus, I thank you because you first loved me before I even knew you. You died on a cross for me, for my sins, for the forgiveness of my sins. Today, Lord, I invite you into my heart. Make me new. Help me to recover my life in you. And I want to commit my way to you and walk with you forevermore. Have your way in my life, Jesus. We pray this in his mighty name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe you prayed something similar before, but you, you feel like you've gotten off track with him, 
then Jesus is in your life. He is at work in your life. We're going to have a time of just worshiping together. And uh, if you want to see some changes in 2020, if God's been knocking at the door of your heart, then uh, uh, I believe that God wants to speak to you this morning. You can receive him in your life, his empowerment in your life. If it's healing, if you've struggled in, in areas of health this year, you can receive healing from him in 2020. If it's provision that you need, if it's healing of relationships, whatever it is, I want to encourage you this morning to bring it to the foot of the cross and rely on Jesus. Or maybe he's been talking to you about uh, a, a ministry opportunity, ways that you can just serve and talk about Jesus more. He might be uh, knocking at the door of your heart about that. I want to invite you to come forward this morning. And, and, and Pastor Bill actually said at 8.30 this morning, he said, don't underestimate, uh, you know, in the times when you don't feel like you've got the words to pray, when somebody else comes alongside you and prays with you, that is powerful. And so let's stand together this morning. Let's commit 2020 to Jesus and believe for his Holy Spirit to move and do mighty things. Amen. Pastor Bill, do you want to share?